Bob Kalishman here for Millennium. And uh, today I like to celebrate and honor the Marines who took part in the invasion of Guadalcanal on 7 August 1942. This is a, a moment in history, history of the United States, in the sense that in World War II, the Japanese had put, pushed back the American forces all the way. And they were run, running rapid in the Pacific and uh, uh, Indonesia, and they had taken uh, Java, and they had really uh, gone through the Middle East, or I should say the Far East. And the only thing standing in their way was the Marine Corps, a division of Marines, who invaded Guadalcanal. And this not only saved the Australians, but it turned the defensive war in the Pacific by the American forces into a offensive war. And on 7 August 1942, under the command of General Vandergriff, the 1st Marine Division landed ashore on Guadalcanal. Now, the prelude, or simultaneously, why the invasion was occurring on Guadalcanal, on the island of Talagi, which was the gateway to, uh, to, to the canal, the... Uh, 2nd Raider Battalion, under the command of uh, Evan Carlson, uh, who at that time was a lieutenant colonel, uh, he led the, the raid. Now, to give you a little background of uh, Colonel Carlson, Colonel Carlson had served in the First World War. He had served in the, more or less, let's call them the Banana Wars, with... Uh, with uh, in the Nicaragua and that area with the bandits and he was pretty familiar with guerrilla warfare and he had left the Marine Corps on a uh, TAD temporary additional duty and he had gone to China and he had taken part with Mao Tse Jung uh, guerrilla forces at that time who were fighting the Japanese along with the Chinese nationalists. And he observed their guerrilla tactics, and they were masters at it, and he adopted all these, all these tactics. Well, at the time when President Roosevelt had become president, and as you know, uh, our President Roosevelt uh, had uh, cerebral palsy, and he had to go down to Arkansas each and every time, once or twice a year, and he would visit the Springs. And at that time, the detachment of Marines that guarded him were under the command of uh, Colonel Carlson, Major Carlson. And he became uh, more or less friendly with the president, but he struck up a friendship with James Roosevelt, the uh, son of uh, the eldest son of uh, President Theodore and Eleanor Roosevelt. And at that time, they became very, very friendly. So when World War II occurred, he had spoke to the president and to the president's son, and he had said the importance of the American forces to have guerrilla warfare tactics and use them against the Japanese. And finally, Roosevelt agreed with him. And it took a little convincing with the Navy, uh, the chief of naval operations, and also at that time, the Marine Corps Commandant, which was General Holcomb. Now, they were opposed to it. Holcomb felt that every Marine should be a raider, which is the case, and every Marine is trained to be a raider, which is the case, but Carlson, felt that uh, the specialists should be uh, created. So under the 
more or less insistence of President Roosevelt, uh, General Holcomb and the Navy Chief of Staff formed two Raider Battalions. One was the first Raider Battalion, which was given to Colonel Red Edson, and he became the commander of the first Raider Battalion, which I'll tell about, which I will uh, relate shortly. And the second Raider Battalion went to uh, Colonel Carlson, and he became the commander of the second Raider Battalion. Now, at the, at the Battle of Guadalcanal, these two Raider Battalions were very, very important, and they participated immensely in conquering and the success of the uh, invasion of Guadalcanal and in defeating the Japanese. Along with the, at that time, the Marine Corps had two parachute battalions. And then, in addition to that, they had the 1st Marine Division. And this was what comprised the invasion force of the United States Marine Corps on Guadalcanal. Now, what had occurred was they, had, they needed Tulagi and other to proceed with the invasion. So Colonel Carlson was assigned the duty of taking Tulagi, and he did it in record time. And what he accomplished was the fact that he went ashore and uh, proceeded with the invasion. And they destroyed the Japanese uh, naval unit that was holding the island. They destroyed them. Uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't one prisoner taken. And... Uh, they uh, had the uh, had the Tulagi, which is the harbor. It's the gateway to the harbor, and uh, they came ashore at what they call Blue Beach, and uh, one battalion went to the left and one battalion went to the right, and uh, they secured the island in record time. These. Uh, Heavenly lady men climbed clumsily over the side of the Higgin boats into chest deep water. Imagine that. Chilled chin deep for the shorter men, and they waded ashore. Imagine doing that. It takes a lot of courage. And uh, the, the Japanese. 3rd Kuru Special Naval Landing Force, they were in charge of Tulagi and Kuavuto in early May 1942. Now that's early May, they occupied the island, and along comes the raiders in August, August 7th, to uh, accomplish their task, and they go ashore. Now, you have to you have to bear in mind that, like today, where we're becoming more and more unprepared to fight a war, in 1941, the American people, we were unprepared. We, we, we did not have the troops. We did not have the equipment. We, did, we, we didn't have anything. All the equipment that the forces under MacArthur used in the Philippines, it was all from World War I. It was all discarded equipment. Many of them, been, many of the live ammunition had become duds. The bullets, the ammunition had, uh, had, after a certain time when ammunition color changes, the powder, it's no longer any good. And this had occurred. And these Marines, Raiders, they went ashore with World War I equipment. Now, the Raiders had a little different or were a little better off in the sense that they had the M1 rifle, the Grand, the M1 Grand. The regular Marine forces that went into Guadalcanal, they had the 
1903 Springfield, which was a good weapon, but it was bolt action. It wasn't semi-automatic. In addition to the weapons that the Raider Battalion squads had, they had a Thompson submachine gun, a BAR, Brownie BAR automatic, mag uh, magazine capability was 20 rounds. They had uh, one Springfield sniper's rifle. Every squad had one sniper. And, he, and his job was if the squad ran into difficulty with a certain element, the sniper, the Marine sniper's job was to come forward, find out who was holding up the movement, and to take out the officer, the Jap in charge, or the Japanese officer in charge, and uh, move forward. So th this was the, this is what they comprised of, right? And uh, that was a Raider squad. Plus, they, uh, they had equipment. Now, the regular Marines went ashore. They had 1903 bayonets, which I'll show. Well, I can do it now. The 1903 bayonet, which was a very, very long bayonet. And when you, get, when you went into the jungle with that bayonet onto the 1903 rifle, both issued World War I, uh, and you went in there, the bayonet was too long, and when you tried to slash or cut or parry, you hit vines, and, and the bayonet was useless. And the opponent, and in that case were Japanese Imperial Army or Japanese Imperial Marines, they could come underneath your long bayonet and cumbersome bayonet, and uh, you were exposed and, and uh, mortally wound you. And plus the fact that they had a hook on it, which I'll, I might as well show you now. Well, what had happened was the long bayonet, and because of the ingenuity and the resourcefulness of the Marines, what they did was, this is a bayonet, and this is the scabbard. This is a revised bayonet. And what they would do is the bayonet was out here. So what they would do in their uh, ingenuity, they would take down and they would, gr they would grind down the bayonet to a shorter bayonet. And this particular bayonet was ground down. And they would file the front of it. And they would have a little cutting edge on the back of it. And if it happened to be an Indian Marine, an American Indian Marine, uh, he, he would grind down both sides so he could cut you both ways. And what would happen in the old bayonet, the World War I bayonet, it was so long that the Japanese had a bayonet with a hook on it. And when they locked bayonets, they would slide down the hook to here, and then they would turn it and either flip the bayonet off the rifle or they flip the rifle and bayonet out of the uh, Marine, Marine's hands and le render him useless. And that was the bayonet. Now, at night, many infantrymen, they were issued a bayonet. They didn't have the luxury of uh, some of these fairy tales with the, bayonet, the brass knuckles and the and all this gory thing. They didn't have the, the brass knuckles. But what you did with your bayonet was you had the bayonet, and it was sharp, and I mean razor sharp, and you had that. And after you tried to cut, and if you needed, and if you needed brass knuckles, right here, this piece of metal, this was your brass knuckles. Whack them. And between the eyes, on the forehead, on the jaw, when you whack them with this, that's like being hit with five brass knuckles. And boom. And, that, and that's all it took was one. And that was it. Now, there's a difference between the bayonet and what I call the trench knife. 
Now, the trench knife is a dagger, and it's sharp on this side, and it's sharp on that side, razor sharp, right? You want your brass knuckle? You got your brass knuckle right there. And, but the thing is, it was a template in the sense that you didn't use it for, you used it for slashing and everything, but the purpose of it was to penetrate the stab. And at night, these raiders, they were smart, they were Americans, and at night, you couldn't see your hand in front of you. And what these raiders would do, they would use two senses. They couldn't, you couldn't see. So they would use two of their senses. The first sense was their hearing. The second sense was their smell. And they could hear movement. But there was no, no way of knowing when the movement stopped how far they were or how near they were. But then you relied on your smell. And you were laying in a, in most cases, you laid in a shallow hole, just more or less protecting you. And if you could get a, a cat nap or a little sleep, but nobody slept, you would try to do it. And you'd lay in the hole. And then when you would hear something, you would be alert. Right? And the first thing you would do is you would take out your knife. Right? You'd take out your knife. And the second thing you would do is you would roll out of the hole. You just roll. You wouldn't get up. You wouldn't bend up. You would roll out. And then as soon as you heard somebody roll into your hole, you took the knife, the template, and boom, and you heard a thug and a sigh, and that was the end of it, right? And that's how you went with that. Your other assistance, which was very, very good, was the grenade, was the hand grenade. The hand grenade the raider would use, here again, in many cases, they were grenades that were issued in World War I, at the beginning of the war. And you would use your hand grenade, okay? We had a spoon pin. We had a pin and a spoon. You put your grenade in your hand, spoon first. It was a little hook that hove over, and that would go in. That was like a safety. And then you would grip the grenade, and you had it here. And in most cases, you would hold it to your chest so you wouldn't be clumsy and lose it. And then you would take your finger and you would pull uh, this tube using your tooth or anything. That's, that's, a, that's another fairy tale. You wouldn't have any teeth if you did it that way. And you'd put your finger in the pin and you'd hold it to your chest and you'd pull it. There would be no noise to it. You wouldn't hear a ping, bang, boom, anything. You just hear the pin. And you let the pin go or hold the pin, whatever you want. In training, what we used to do was we would keep the pin, and uh, then after we put it, we would put it in our, our fatigue hats. Be where the air holes are, we would put in, in how many grenades you threw that day. To have, you'd have, you had four air holes, so you'd have one, two, three, up to four. That's how you would do it in training, to show that you, you, you can throw a grenade. But, you would, they would hold it, pull the pin, right? And this is at night. And then you would put it outside the hole where you heard the, new, the noise and let it go. And you would hear ping, and that would be the pin getting off. But it wouldn't give away your position because it's in front of the hole. You've rolled out of the hole. So they don't know, they know where the noise came from, but they don't know where you are. And you would stay there. And in about six seconds or so, that grenade would go off, and you would see boom, all shrapnel going everywhere. In most cases, if you were lucky, it would kill the opponent, and it would end up that uh, it wouldn't give away your 
position. Because if you fired with a rifle in the, at night, you, there's a flash. There's a big white flash, yellow white flash. <coughs> Pardon me. But if you use a grenade and you put it out there in the evening, that's all you see is the grenade going off. They don't know where you are. And that's how that was happening. That happened. This here on the O3 and the Grand M1, this is a sling that all Marines in World War II, Korea, and possibly Vietnam, but in Vietnam they changed from the leather sling to a cloth sling. That someday I'll bring it in and show it to you what that looks like. But this here is a a leather rifle sling, right? It's a very useless thing. It looks like oh, they, you just the average person looks at it and says, oh, the average raider. The only thing he used that for was to to carry his rifle. Wrong. This thing is hooked onto the rifle, and it's used when you're when you're firing. What you do is, and you're running with your rifle, and you and you stop the fire. Right. Usually, what you do is you put your left hand into the sling, hold your rifle, and this is down at the bottom, and you put your elbow, or but it's, it's like a cradle, and the rifle lays into the cradle, gives you steadiness, and uh, that's why a Marine Corps is an expert rifleman. He, he hits the target each and every time, and it's because of the leather sling. And the snipers use this very, very effectively. Plus, if you needed it, you could use it. You could take it off. And if you were shot in the leg or whatever, and, the, and there was no uh, corpsman around, you could use this for a tourniquet. By tourniquet, I mean to cut the flow of blood so you wouldn't bleed to death until they got to you. And, that, and this is just uh, another rifle. But that... The point I, I wanted to bring that out for is we're in the same situation today as what we were in in 1940. We're cutting back on our military. We're cutting back on our equipment. We're cutting back on everything, and the world situation gets, gets more tense and becomes worse and worse and worse. And we're going to, and if we're not careful and we don't stop the politician from what they're doing, we're going to find that we're going to be caught without any, any, any armed forces to protect us. We're cutting our naval force, we're cutting our air force, we're cutting our army, and, and we're cutting the Marine Corps to a ridiculous flow figure. In my opinion, one of the finest, the finest fighting units in the country. What are we doing? We're cutting them to placate a bunch of people that uh, feel, oh, we, we don't need it anymore. It's foolishness. We need it. Let's not get caught like we were caught in, in, the, in, in the 40s. Let's not get caught like we were caught in the 50s in Korea. Let's not let it happen again. Let's have a strong reliable Marine Corps. Now, I've more or less spent a lot of time on this, and I wanted to cover a little more, but I just figure uh, I'd like to more or less cover the opposing Japanese force at the Tenaru. The Tenaru was a, a battle fought on Guadalcanal. It was a serious battle. And uh, the Americans were taken for granted. The Marines were taken for granted at the Battle of Tenaru, Allegretti Creek. And they had General, well, he was a colonel at that time, Colonel Konodo Aikichi. He was the commander of the 28th Japanese Imperial Army, 
28th Regiment. This was a regiment that was never defeated. And the attitude they had, they couldn't be defeated. Well, let me tell you, the people that defeated them were the Marines with the help of the Edson Raiders. They defeated them at, uh, at Teneru. People like Major Bailey, Medal of Honor winner, people like John Bazalone, machine gunner, people like Jack Sugarman, corporal, United States Marine Corps, machine gunner. They defeated these people, it's these people that nobody could defeat. The United States Marines defeated them. They gave them a good licking. And the only one that came out was the commander, this uh, Colonel Akichi, and he committed Harry Carey because the Marine Corps embarrassed him. Now, I want to mention the Marines, or for that matter, the people that received the Medal of Honor on Guadalcanal. Major Kennedy Bailey, United States Marine Corps. Sergeant John Bassalone, machine gunner, United States Marine Corps. Harold Williams Bear, United States Marine Corps. Anthony Casamento, uh, Marine Corps. Uh, Colonel Merritt Edson, Marine Corps Raider. William G. Forner, U.S. Army. Douglas Albert Monroe, United States Coast Guard. Here's a Coast Guardman. Uh, Rear Admiral Scott. Admiral Scott was, was uh, received the Medal of Honor. He went down with a ship on uh, the Battle of Salvo Island, which was a very, very important battle. And this is the Marine Corps Raider emblem that they wore on their sleeve, on their shoulder patch. And it's a skull with five stars. Those stars represent the Southern Cross. This is the Southern Cross that when you, you can't see it from the northern sky, you have to go into the Pacific to see the Southern Cross. And that's what it represents. And it's also present on the United States Marine Corps uh, First Division patch and the United States Marine Corps Second Division patch. Those stars, they represent the Southern Cross. Because the Marine Corps was very, very helpful and they, they prevented the Japanese from going down into Australia. And to this day, if you go to Australia and you mention that you're a veteran of the Battle of Guadalcanal, you're put up on a bar or put up wherever you are, and you're, uh, you're considered a saint in that country. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting me and letting me into your homes. And uh, I was hoping to uh, give you a political report. Unfortunately, I ran out of time, but I felt that uh, August is a good time particularly August 7th, which is tomorrow, to honor the United States Marine Corps and to the men and women of the armed forces, the Army, Navy, and Coast Guard, and particularly the Marine Corps that saved Guadalcanal. Thank you and uh, God bless. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.